Hello there. Today we are here at the Radisson Blue Plaza in Sydney for the Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning and Robotics Healthcare Conference. I spoke with experts in the field around AI, privacy and data protection, emerging technologies and the regulatory framework. Artificial intelligence is growing in its relevance to healthcare. However, the implementation into clinical settings can pose new risks with data. I spoke with Professor Erwin Lowe following a panel discussion on the possibilities and caution needed with AI. We're here with Professor Erwin Lowe. Can you tell us about yourself and your role within your organisation? Sure. So I'm the Group Chief Medical Officer for St Vincent's Health Australia and also the Group General Manager of Clinical Governance. So in that role, I look after quality and safety, the professional governance of doctors and research. We talked about um, humans focusing on judgment, so as in physicians focusing on judgment, whereas AI does the prediction for them um, and eventually maybe replace. But my question is, how far are we from that considering the physician to patient ratios, which are so skewed across the world? Um, and what is the implication of AI in solving that issue? AI has it develops and improves will help to resolve some of the imbalances, health in, in in equalities in around the world. It's potentially the great equalizer. In health in general, AI provides strong clinical decision support for our clinicians to make the right decisions to give the best care. But in trials, it also helps to support our researchers to identify the right patients and to ensure that the trials that we're running are safe. What's worked so far and what hasn't? Well, AI in general has worked really well in ensuring that we provide best practice care to our patients and to allow our researchers to undertake trials in the right manner. In terms of what hasn't gone well, I suppose uh, we just need to make sure that we are aware of what's being introduced and that it's done in a very safe manner. And what do patients need to know about AI? Well, patients need to understand that already they're using AI every day on their smartphones, on their computers, and really they need to be assured uh, that hospitals like the ones that we run are making, uh, introducing AI in a safe and effective manner. One of the areas where artificial intelligence is starting to impact design, selection and recruitment is in clinical trials. I spoke with Dr. Stefan Harra on its uptake and advancement. I'm a researcher and manager at IBM Research Australia, I lead the brain-inspired computing research team there. My background is computer engineering and uh, data science. I've also spent quite some time working in biotechnology and healthcare analytics. There's also some work I've done in technology management and biomedical engineering. What's the brain-inspired computer research and what is your role in the group? We are developing technology that analyzes brain data to develop technologies that can help to better diagnose, manage and treat neurological diseases and specifically epilepsy. I have one foot in the world of core AI where we develop core algorithms and my other foot stands firmly in the world of medical applications where we work with clinical partners to apply what we develop in the world of AI to create valuable solutions in the world of healthcare and life science. Now let's talk about use cases. And you know, naturally, um, I have chosen to present some of the work that we do on infusing AI technology into the clinical trial design step. The motivation for this is pretty obvious, and it stuns me every time I look at this chart. Right? It's the famous pharma dilemma. It's essentially the fact that despite increasing, increasing investment into the drug development pipeline by pharma, the number of drugs that hit the market decreases constantly. I was talking about a famous problem which the pharma industry faces, and that is called the pharma dilemma. In essence, it means that while investments in developing new drugs are constantly increasing, the number of approved drugs that hit the market falls constantly. That is a business model that's not sustainable, and so all stakeholders in that drug development cycle are looking for possible leads to change that. Artificial intelligence can be such a lead, and I've been talking about ways on how artificial intelligence could possibly be introduced to the clinical trial design process to make it more efficient in the future. We can look at the inner workings of the drug development cycle and identify bits and pieces of that process that we believe can be improved 
by bringing AI to the table. So that's what we're going to be doing. What are the main reasons for the failure in clinical trials and how can AI better support patient selection and recruitment? That's a hard question and there is no one answer as to what the reasons are. There's a multitude of you know, shortcomings in the design process, in the execution of clinical trials that contributes to that pharma dilemma. But it is very clear that two of the main reasons that hamper efficiency of trials are a shortcoming in getting the right patients to a trial before it starts, so that is the recruitment uh, part of the cl clinical trial design step. And then the second problematic area is monitoring patients efficiently when the trial runs. That is important for endpoint detection, for controlling whether our patients adhere to trial protocols and to retain them in the trial before they drop out. That's where AI can start to add value. We can empower patients to understand clinical trial criteria more seamlessly through things such as, for example, nat natural language processing, which is a technology that can plow through you know, written text, such as complicated trial announcements, and extract these pieces of information automatically and then present these to doctors and patients alike to make a natural matchmaking between the trial criteria and the patient. That is a way uh, that artificial intelligence can contribute to clinical you know, trial matching, as it's called. And then another example I'll give you is in the world of monitoring patients during the trials, which is deep learning technology that runs on variable sensors to automatically lock what patients are doing, whether they are here to trial protocols or whether they are exhibiting a behavior that you know, gives rise to a risk for you know, dropping out of the trial. We can pick this up automatically through what's called disease diaries and then use that to proactively engage with patients to help them stay on track. Mostly, we see early stage proof of concept studies that show that bits and pieces of clinical trial design steps can be you know, improved as to their performance um, through artificial intelligence. So these are early studies. We see those, for example, in the field of disease diaries, where in neurological diseases, diseases, for example, which are notoriously hard to monitor because the disease itself renders patients often you know, incapable of logging the disease episodes, where we can use artificial intelligence and disease diaries to get a better understanding of the patient behavior and what happens in these patients' lives. That's something um, that we see as an onset in the field where variable sensors, software that can run and analyze data in real time is used to build these diaries. Another example is in the field of natural language processing. We in IBM have a technology um, that, uh, that helps that part of the trial design process. It's called uh, IBM Watson for Clinical Trial Design and that solution uses natural language processing to do that trial matching process more efficiently. There's 12 IBM research labs that work on epilepsy, for example, is a close collaboration be between our Zurich lab, our Haifa lab, our Tokyo lab, and Australia, and of course New York. I think the potential of AI has been demonstrated to some of, through some of these use cases in a very you know, captivating way. So. It is clear that there is something that AI can do to help these various steps become more efficient. Now, what comes with you know, the enthusiasm and you know, the expectations is sometimes also a hype that we need to fight. So it's a very clear path forward. We need to do research. We need to assess this research properly. And there is a whole lot of work we need to do on the side of making these algorithms explainable and fair before they can actually be introduced to clinical trials in real life. Now, when we do all this, and you know, after we will have assessed the impact of all of, all of this, I believe strongly that you know, what AI is expected to do will actually happen and that AI will live up to the high expectations that are put into it right now. What are some of the hurdles? Data privacy and the data interoperability problem, I'll explain that in a second, are some of the biggest hurdles. 
all this, you know, AI in its purest sense, works through infusing data into that AI ecosystem. And we are talking about highly sensitive patient data here. This is highly sensitive data which needs to be kept secure and private. So regulations around data need to be observed at all times. That's something that needs to be built into these solutions. Data often isn't digital to begin with. It resides in different places. Access rights are highly different. It's not easy to infuse that data into an ecosystem so that AI can work with the data and at the same time preserving these data privacy and security rights. But it needs to be done, of course. So this is one big hurdle and a subject of active work of researchers, regulatory bodies in the field. Another hurdle is through the AI models, the algorithms themselves. They need to be explainable, they need to be fair, they need to be transparent, and they need to be built in such a way that the purpose is clear and that accountability is also there. That means we don't need to just build the model, the algorithm itself, but we need to make sure that all these levels are also incorporated into our algorithm. With AI, that is not an easy thing to do. Algorithms change as data is infused into the system, and that is something that we need to work on just as much as building the algorithms in the first place. It's an area of active research aside from the technical algorithm building. AI at the point of care has the potential to transform the interaction between clinical staff and patients. Dr. Malcolm Pradhan spoke to me about his presentation on the application of AI in the palm of the clinician's hand. I'm Chief Medical Officer at Alcidian and uh, in that role I'm responsible for product design and helping uh, to generate the next uh, versions of the, of the platform that we're building and the technology and uh, also uh, explain that technology to clinicians and uh, people out in the field. We've got this kind of model in healthcare right now where, you know, if you're sick, you go to see a doctor and you wait for an appointment or you wait in the ED. The great thing at the moment is great, you've got now devices that can take data and then you go to your doctor, right? But really what we're talking about is a continuous model of healthcare where you've got data that it's going up into being monitored for you uh, as we're integrating other bits of data such as, you know, even things like giving you scripts, knowing what medications you're on, understanding your preferences what you want to achieve in terms of your goals, uh, and then can triage you based on your engagement level, your literacy, all sorts of things into various things, some of which are doctors and nurses and other things as Can well. AI transform the role of a clinical user at the point of care? Yes, I think it, I think it definitely can. And it's amazing all this time we haven't really been able to effectively put any assistance for clinicians really at the point of care, despite the fact that the technology has been available for many years. And I think it's more than can it, but it really has to if healthcare is going to be sustainable. At the moment, uh, we have cl uh, clinicians struggling to get through their work every day and burning out. Yet we know that the burden on the healthcare system is only going to increase through an ageing population who are more complex. So it's really uh, up to us uh, uh, as, a, as a healthcare system, uh, uh, people uh, at the coalface, administrators and vendors to come up with ways to integrate AI assistance for clinicians so they can do their work faster and also understand where clinical risk is so they can manage clinical risk in a proactive way rather than in a, you know, in a responsive or retrospective manner. Could you talk to us about the Maya Precision Platform and Maya Mobile? So the Maya Precision Platform is a, is, a, is a fairly new product over the last few years and it's really designed to run algorithms at scale and safely on existing IT infrastructure uh, in hospitals. So we take data from EMRs, we convert it into an open standards format called FIRE, Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. And uh, based on that uh, open standards data, we run algorithms and we allow other people to plug in algorithms such as we partner with CSIRO and others to plug in new algorithms that can detect uh, problems in real time on, uh, on, on clinical data. And then we have mechanisms to put that back into clinical workflows such as web-based dashboards or mobile devices. Uh, and one of the products that we're, I'm talking about today is a fairly new product 
uh, which is a mobile application that really presents a full electronic medical record data in real time on a mobile device, but then puts a lens of decision support and AI on top of that to highlight clinical risks and help automate certain workflows that we know will improve patient outcomes. So what we did instead is we actually brought the EMR into the mobile device. So here we have the full patient record, including vitals, allergies, I'll get back to monitors a bit, results, tasks, medications, and, and uh, for example, you know, with the full medication list coming live out of the EMR. And you can then go in a second and review labs, for example, and look through you know, your critical results. So the ability to get to data in seconds is really important to, uh, to, to, this, whole, to this whole exercise. The main topics were really to give people an idea of the different types of AI out there and, and how some AI, you know, particularly that based on machine learning or black box models, require special care uh, in terms of being able to implement them safely in a healthcare system. Uh, some of the differences between the machine learning or descriptive models and the prescriptive stuff. In other words, how do we give guidance which is evidence-based, uh, which you aren't really going to learn from, from data because we know a lot of practice isn't evidence-based. And then how do we uh, use an interoperable platform to layer on top of existing IT systems to add an extra layer of value and really uh, get the concept across that what's missing in healthcare is smart infrastructure that allows us to build on top of all the data out there to uh, turn it into actionable information uh, and decision support at the coalface through, through mobility. And so we roll this out. Uh, in, uh, with some doctors, and, and it wasn't actually designed as an ED system, but we started out in the ED at, uh, at, uh, in, in the uh, eHealth New South Wales pilot in Murrumbidgee, and what we found uh, was that the ED doctors took it up really, really well, and in a few days, they came back and said, could you turn on some extra notifications for us? And we were really surprised because, you know, doctors asking for more notifications is, is really rare. But what had happened is that because they'd won time in accessing the clinical data and the EMR data and they weren't having to go and find their computer and log in, they now said, actually, yeah, well, when someone comes in with a neck of, you know, a fall and, they, and their x-ray gets, I want to know when that x-ray is back so I can quickly check to send them on the right path. Or if someone's got a troponin and the second troponin's out, I want to know, you know, just so I know what to do with them. And, and so they come out with all these, you know, it took them a few days to sort of click on, oh, well, actually receiving notifications isn't going to destroy my day. In fact, it's going to really help me going back and looking up stuff. And we're saving them lots and lots of clicks. What do patients need to know about AI? Well, I think, I think, they, I think patients really need to understand that AI can uh, personalise care for them and provide them uh, their clinicians and I think gradually the, the patients themselves with information that they can engage in conversations and, and be a more uh, active participant in the decision making around their health care. I think that's going to be a really important part of the future because really the future of healthcare and its sustainability is really keeping people out of hospital. And the only way to do that is to engage patients in their care so they can understand when things are, are not going well and what the best avenues are uh, to mitigate problems before they become so bad they have to get into hospital. We've heard from experts in the field in topics around privacy and data protection, emerging technologies, AI and machine learning, and what this actually means for the patient. Thank you very much for watching. My name is Anne Dow from the Australian Health Journal.